cultures for ourselves. This vicarious travel from the comfort of one's own home did not first occur with the invention of social media, streaming services, or even television and movies. Rather, it was thanks to the development of movable type combined with the printed image during the early modern period that made the popular pastime of armchair travel possible. 16th and 17th century European voyages around the globe brought spices, sugar, tea and coffee, porcelain, silk, and other material goods to the European market, changing European tastes in terms of food, dress, and home furnishing. Along with the commodities came accounts of the European experiences abroad. Travelogues were published in droves in Europe in the early modern period, giving the power and reach of the Dutch East India Company during the 17th century, Amsterdam was a major center for both the sale of exotic materials and the publication of, uh, about the destinations from which those commodities originated. Dutch publishers created everything from pocket-sized books to full folio tomes. The subject matter ranged from as much as the size from the adventures of attacks by polar bears in the Arctic to botanical guides to explanations of the local people, their dress, religions, and cultural customs. This variety of size, subject matter, and number of illustrations, and the high literacy rate in the Netherlands meant that people of a wide range of interest and socioeconomic levels owned such travelogues. In Amsterdam, not only were travelogues published in the vernacular, but also in French and German, and even English, expanding the reach of Dutch publications into broader European markets, reaching as far as London to Vienna. The act of both publication and reading were undeniably uh, collaborative and social. The acts of book production and reading, uh, sorry, uh, the book, both of the uh, acts of pr book production and reading were very popularly social activities in Europe. Furthermore, in his book, The Nature of the Book, Print and Knowledge in the Making, Adrian John states, quote, text cannot compel readers to react in a specific ways but that they must be interpreted in cultural spaces, the character of which helps to decide what counts as proper reading. In short, this recasting has the advantage of positioning the cultural and social where they should be at the center of our attention, end quote. Thus, I would like to discuss the production and reading of travelogues as a means of social networking. The author, publisher, and engravers involved in the making and marketing of travelogues presented a version of the destination aimed at a particular readership. The citation and referencing of manuscripts and published texts reinforced the intellectual and religious positions of their creators. Even the book's uh, dedication as a means of, quote, seeking favor of the great were a common feature of the early modern book world, end quote. The consumption of these travelogues was a form of social media as well. They became a part of collections, and particularly these large folio-sized books were poured over communally and discussed. Readers could show off their knowledge of the sources, both textual and visual, upon which the travelogue relied, thus helping posture themselves socially. For the purposes of today's talk, I will focus on the destination of India. Both of a uh, uh, both of these travelogues were published in Dutch and German in Amsterdam in 1672, and shortly thereafter translated into English and published in London. Specifically, I will discuss the two particular authors, uh, presentations of the first of the Dash Avatara or 10 avatars of the Hindu god Vishnu in their travelogue. These authors are Philip Baldeus and Ulfert Dapper. Given the breadth of dissemination of Baldeus and Dapper's work across Europe and the citation of both in later highly notable works, um, although they're not the first Europeans to publish on this subject, they clearly became an authority. To truly understand Baldeus and Dapper's contributions to the European understanding of India in the early modern period, I will answer the questions, what sources did Baldeus and Dapper reference in writing about the avatars of Vishnu and their illustrations, and how does their framework of the travelogue as a social media um, entity inform our understanding and interpretation of the images and their accompanying texts? <laughs> 
So a little bit about who these authors are. Philip Aldeas um, was born in Delft in 1632 and was a minister and traveled in his, this capacity with the VOC or Dutch East India Company from 1656 to 1666. As you can see here, the original Dutch in yellow and the English translation in blue, his book was called A True and Exact Description of the Most Celebrated East India Coast of Malabar and Coromandel. The text was split into three parts, uh, the first of which was about the uh, Malabar and Coromandel coast, the second about the island of Ceylon, uh, where he lived for about a decade, and the third, uh, uh, the third section was called the idolatry of the East India pagans, a true and full account of their religious worships of the inhabitants of Coromandel, the Malabars, the Ceylonese, with descriptions of their idols. And you can see here on the map uh, in red places he lived and visited uh, in India and in green in Ceylon. During his time in, as a minister in Jaffna in Ceylon, Baldeus had access to the abandoned Catholic college and their religious archives there. Thanks to Mika Bermer's work, archival work, we now know that a Ceylonese convert to Christianity named Karat Mosapotman uh, acted as Baldeus's assistant and even traveled back to the Netherlands with Baldeus. After Baldeus uh, was dismissed from his work with the VOC for establishing schools um, unlike the way uh, the Dutch want, or the VOC wanted him to in Ceylon. We can see that both individuals in this portrait by Johan de la Roquette, uh, which is now in the Rijksmuseum, are, uh, are uh, Aldeas and his informant, Mosa Potman. Also, uh, his establishment, involvement in the establishment of Dutch schools abroad underlines his concern for education. Baldeus's publishers were Johannes Jansonius van Vosburg and Jan, uh, Johannes van Sommeren. The former came from a famed publishing family that was well connected with other families and their, in their related fields, such as the Blaus. And van Vosburg will come back into play in a moment. Ulfert Dopper was born in the Jordaan in Amsterdam in 1636 and studied medicine at Utrecht. Instead of practicing medicine, Dopper wrote prolifically about destinations ranging from his hometown of Amsterdam, 1670, uh, 1663, to Africa, 1668, China, 1670, the Middle East, 1672 and 77, and of course, India in 1672, to name just a few. This output of travel literature within the span of 25 years in the era of slow sea travel was a result of great research and compilation, not personal experience. Dopper was an armchair traveler, having never left, uh, traveled far beyond the Low Countries. His travel experience was just as imagined as those reading his books. His text on India, the titles again, Dutch and yellow, English and blue, Asia, the first part being an accurate description of Persia and the several provinces thereof, the vast empire of the Great Mughal and other parts of India and several regions. Uh, and that's uh, the truncated version. So I will from now on refer to it as Asia. Dopper's texts were a full folio size and filled with intricate engravings, maps, etc. The combination of the lavishness of his book and the reputation of his publisher, Jakob van Meurs, linked his work to an elite social network of readers. Where religion and education were the foci for Baldeus, uh, social status was more of a focus for Dopper. Now to the images. The Dasha Avatara, or 10 primary forms of Vishnu, in which he is said to have descended to restore cosmic order to the world. The avatars vary slightly depending on the sect and region, the most variation uh, being in the penultimate and antepenultimate incarnations. For that sake, I will just refer to the first one uh, known as the Matya Avatar, coming from the Sanskrit for fish. Looking at Baldeus and Dapper's version, the handling of space and the humanoid body are starkly different. Vishnu's humanoid torso emerging from the mouth of the fish with his four arms holding, a, a, attributed to his, um, holding his attributes and crown upon his head. Brahma, the creator, a four-headed god and four-armed deities um, upon the lo uh, lotus blossom in both compositions. But the similarities do not extend much further. 
both Dopper and Baldeus Matia avatar images include a landscape setting and some sense of depth and atmosphere, including the requisite palms and parasols in Dopper's version, which denote some exotic location. Dopper's scene is far more complex, though through his heavy use of chiaroscuro, which appeals much more to the European sensibilities in terms of approaches to paintings and prints of the time. The most eye-catching aspect of Dopper's version is the form of Vishnu himself. The deep black skin and strong muscles make the god look more like he is more of African origin than the blue-black complexion of, from Indian tradition. The skin tone and musculature is matched only by the beheaded torso uh, leaning on a shield in the foreground. Blood spurts forth from this figure in a manner that evokes the Caravaggio's Judith slaying Holofernes or the plucky knight with a mere flesh wound from Monty Python's Holy Grail. This disembodied head of Dopper's demon is much more like the goat of, in the monstrous version of deities in early European handlings of Indian um, deities. In Baldeus's, there is no body but a conch shell that appears spilling out liquid. Where Baldeus's version has just four figures praying towards the Matya, Dopper's has a whole parade of supplicants winding back as far as the horizon. The overall impact is far more theatrical in Dopper's and is more simplified in Baldeus's. So does this amplify vastly different sources? It's true that a certain amount of distinction between Dopper and Baldeus's text can be um, attributed in part to the dispar disparity in personal experience, with Baldeus having been a part of an official VOC uh, endeavor to the South Asia. Yet, both Baldeus and Dapper relied heavily on previously published materials. Dapper refers by name to previous authors, including Della Valle, Kircher, Twist, just to name a few. Dapper most heavily quotes the Dutch, uh, sorry, Baldeus most heavily quotes the Dutch predicant or minister, Abraham Rogarius, uh, in his Open Door to the Secrets of Heathendom and occasionally even including page numbers, which is rather uh, untraditional at the time. A further challenge is finding the, is that the engravers who created these images also likely never traveled beyond the Netherlands. They had to rely on the journals and letters of travelers and the scant number of images that made it back to Amsterdam. Each of these new renditions of the avatars of Vishnu thus presented through a differing European lens aimed at a European audience. The early modern uh, imagined travel was a version of India that existed basically in the minds of their European creators from their own viewpoints uh, and represent reality just as much as a heavily filtered, photoshopped and staged social media post does today. Importing images from Indian artists was no easy task. Danish travelogue writer Baltimaeus Ziegenbalg, later than both Baldeus and Dapper, wrote of his experience trying to obtain images of the deities, quote, it was very difficult to get the pictures of the deities in their true forms. European painters could not draw them because they were not allowed in the temples. At the same time, the Tamil painters declined to draw them. They stated that their religion did not permit them to copy the deities in their true forms and hand them over to Christians because they knew well, that they did not honor, but despised and scorned them greatly, unquote. The versions of the Dasha Avatara in Europe during the early modern period can be traced to three mostly extant versions by Indian artists. One, as you see here, is in the Postel Reti Abbey uh, Library in Belgium. Uh, it is not open to researchers, so no uh, living researchers have seen the actual copy, but luckily a photocopy of the entire manuscript exists here in Leiden. Uh, Leiden history professor Caroline Stolta wrote her dissertation on the manuscript and the circumstances of its creation and provenance. According to Stolta, Angel uh, paired these Indian images uh, with from an undisclosed um, origin uh, with the handwriting um, in his handwriting from a Gujarati text. Uh, it comes from the Gujarat region, that, but that's about all we know from it. Although, uh, although Angel's version is not available to researchers, as I said, you can see in this photocopy that Matya's skin is a darker color and has just the four devotees, much like in Baldeus's version. And it bears 
much less similarity to Dopper's. In terms of citation, Baldeus refers heavily to Rogerius' uh, text um, as he does on Ungal's images, a point for which Baldeus is heavily critiqued in the secondary literature. Between this and his unsighted use of Father Giacomo Finizio 1609's manuscripts, uh, Partha Mitter, author of Much Maligned Monsters, refers to Baldeus as an unscrupulous plagiarist, although, although the idea of plagiarism is anachronistic. Baldeus cited Rogarius and omitted the name Finizio, potentially for uh, confessional reasons, but more likely for social and economic ones. Rogarius, like Baldeus, uh, traveled to India and lived in Surat in 1632 and Pulakot from 1633 to 42. Uh, his book, which relied on information from a Smirtha Brahmin named Padamama, uh, was published posthumously first in Leiden by, uh, in Dutch by Francois Hock and in, uh, in 1651, and then later uh, in French uh, in Amsterdam called uh, The Theater of Idolatry or the Open Door. Um, and this second version published in 1670 uh, by Jean Skipper or Jan Skipper um, is the only one with images. The, earlier version does not have images. The important social networking link here I discovered through looking at the work of Is Isabella von Eichen, uh, Baldeus's publisher, Johannes van Bosberg, uh, after the death of his father in 1664, rented a property for his bookshop. The landlord was none other than the widow of Jan Skipper. So at least financially speaking, there are mutual interests here. Okay. Uh, Dapper does not cite Rogarius, although he does cite Jesuit, Jesuit missionary Athanasius Kircher's China Illustrata. Just like Dapper, Kircher was a very successful armchair traveler. Uh, he wrote from the comfort of the Vatican, relying on the fathers Johann Gruber and Heinrich Roth, who traveled from Agra, India, which is north central India. Uh, he includes a series of Indian miniatures, which from Father Roth, Roth, which have since been lost. Kierker's text was first published also by Johannes Jansonius van Bosberg uh, in 1667, and interestingly enough, also in 1667, identically by Jakob van Meurs, Dopper's own publisher. Kierker's versions of the 10 avatars of Vishnu are identical or virtually identical to those of Rogarius and are in the same misordered, mislabeled versions, complete with the Sanskrit and translations. Um, so there does seem to be a bit of sharing going on here very directly. Um, so what about the two other Indian, oh, and here they are all together, the Rogarius, the Kircher, and the Baldeus and Dapper. So what about these two other Indian versions and where does Dapper get his sources? The second Indian version is now in the British Museum. It was formerly, formerly accompanied by a Dutch manuscript, uh, which is verbatim identical to Angel's version, which is now in the British Library, all owned by Sir Hans Sloan. The provenance of this collection um, of images is unknown before Sloan. It is possible that he acquired it uh, from the Dutch connection, but we do not know any connection between him and Dapper or Van Meurs. The third version is uh, an incomplete version, uh, has only eight of the 10 avatars of Vishnu and is now in the Bibliothèque Nationale Francaise uh, and is much more difficult to connect to anyone, though some have linked it to Kierkegaard's China Illustrata um, and possible uh, connection to Heinrich Roth's account. So, In conclusion, more work needs to be done in terms of disentangling and reconnecting these existing Indian and European versions with and from one another. But it is using this format of social networks of the creators and the consumers seems to be the most fruitful way to do it in terms of citation and references and understanding the goals of each of the publishers and authors to their reading audiences. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Maggie, for your, your talk. It's, uh, it's fascinating uh, to see how actually a whole network of authors, and mostly armchair travelers, influenced each other and, and, and where they get their sources and how they appropriate these sources differently or, or in parallel. And of course, also how the, the audience uh, worked, uh, worked on that. Please, if you do have, have questions, just uh, put them in, in the chat so, so we can ask, I can ask to, uh, to, uh, to Maggie. Uh, but I do have, uh, have, have a, a, a very broad question, actually. You concentrate on the Indian subcontinent, but the, the findings you have regarding those, those, those networks and the functioning of that network and that, that mutual reception, can you broaden that up to, to, to other uh, parts of, of the world, the reception or the, 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 the travelogues uh, about other parts of the world? Um, so my dissertation itself is about uh, focusing on the Indian subcontinent, but there certainly is, um, I think that this framework of social networking can be applied to uh, travelogues of other destinations as well. And as we see with uh, people like uh, Kierker, his book, China Illustrata, includes not only India, but also references to China itself, as the mm -hmm. title says, and Japan, um, neither of which did he travel to, but the list of um, other uh, Jesuits did, um, that uh, Van Meurs, the publisher of um, Dopper also published Johann Neuhoff's account to China, uh, part of a semi-official embassy there. Uh, so certainly uh, a greater project in this line would be creating um, ideally some sort of social network mapping mm -hmm. uh, because there, there are only so many publishers um, and also so only so many travelers at the time that uh, certainly this can be expanded to to reach arguably all travelogue authors mm -hmm. of the time. And then the whole the whole functioning of that kind of arm, armchair travelers taking their sources, finding the sources, sources, and really having responses in in a, in a close network. When does that stop? Actually, is that typically for 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 the seventeenth century? Can you expand it to the eighteenth century? Does it change? I don't know in which period. Yes, yeah, certainly it expands through to the 18th century, both Dopper and Baldeus. Uh, so Baldeus did travel um, and uh, Rogarius traveled and uh, others did travel, but um, both uh, Baldeus and Dopper are directly cited in Bernard Picard's uh, multi-tome uh, version of all the religions of the world. So I'm actually um, also working on a project, a collaborative project through the University of Minnesota on uh, Bernard Picard. Uh, so oh, yes. my focus for them is the India portion, um, but it, it, he's certainly, uh, Picard is not traveling either, but becomes the first European account of all, all the religions of the world. Um, and it's, it's really very, very comprehensive. So it certainly expands through the 18th century. And then Picard is uh, published and republished and translated and republished up until the early 19th century. Great. As well. There's a question from Hannah Kagan Moore. Uh, do we have a sense of the production numbers of these various volumes and how many likely circulated in the 17th century? Uh, yes, thank you, Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Um, yes, we do. I mean, uh, many of them are luckily extant um, and uh, <clears throat> they're, they were ending up in princely collections uh, and also just more elite collections uh, just because of the size and number of illustrations all around Europe. Uh, many of them have made their way to the States and even now to South Africa. Um, and so it, just by looking at WorldCat, I can tell that um, potentially hundreds of each of these existed. And um, as I briefly said before, they are uh, translated immediately into German um, and then also into English, some even into French. Um, Van Meurs dies, I believe, around 1680, um, and he has some financial trouble. So uh, he's being really successful for a while, and then there seems to be less interest in, in um, the collecting of these massive uh, volumes. So um, he leaves his widow with quite the backlog. Mm -hmm. 
uh, to have to sell off. Um, and I believe there's even a story of uh, when his daughter gets married, the dowry has something to do with a bunch of uh, unsold volumes of travel logs as well. All right. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question from Thais regarding that that real traveler, not the armchair traveler angle. Uh, mm. Travel to India, so it does not seem to be necessary to look for the sources of his images in European collections. Do you look more widely than the Bibliothèque Nationale de France and the BL? Uh. So, in how far uh, do you do you look beyond those European collections? Right. Um, so I'm looking into the European collections to try to ascertain which um, versions like the Angel uh, ma made it into European hands uh, during the 17th century. Um, so that's the con connection there. Those are versions made by Indian artists, mm -hmm. not by uh, European artists. Uh, but I have certainly been looking elsewhere to try to figure out uh, ones that, 17th century ones that can be somehow linked to these social networks. Um, it's, I mean, certainly quite difficult, uh, particularly uh, when provenance isn't well known um, because I, what I'm trying to figure out is what these authors, engravers, et cetera, might have seen. Um, so if he has any suggestions of places to look or if anyone has suggestions of places to look uh, for other versions, these are the three that I know of um, and that have been written about as being um, known by Europeans, but I don't, I'm still looking beyond that. Yeah. I would love to find more if possible. All right, clear. So, so Tess, please, uh, you can also, of course, uh, give some, some additions uh, of where to find uh, the sources. Uh, Matthew Lim, uh, do you have any sense of how these European depictions of India were received in the Indian subcontinent? Uh, very interesting question. Thank you, Matt. Um, confused. Uh, I, certainly, they probably didn't make it back to the Indian subcontinent during the 17th century or even into the 18th necessarily. But um, those who are familiar with the the lore of uh, or the the mythology or um, the stories of the Dash Avatara um, find them confusing, particularly the Dapper. I mean, the Dapper, it's, uh, I just showed you one of the 10, um, is much, it, almost unrecognizable <laughs> to, a, to an Indian viewer um, in how like I said, theatrical they are, how ex extreme they are, um, that uh, even contemporary uh, experts on Hinduism um, who don't really know the, the context, I've looked at them with them and it took them a while to figure out, oh, I think this is what they're doing here or saying here. <laughs> um, so certainly pu puzzling, if nothing else. And as uh, this Egan Bog uh, quote that I included notes, it, I mean, the truly religious would find them offensive um, and sacrilegious, certainly. All right. Thank you, Maggie, for, for this wonderful talk. Thank you, Hannah, Thanks. Thais, and Matthew for, for, for your most interesting uh, questions. And then now give the floor to uh, Catherine Powell. Catherine uh, comes from the University of Texas at Austin. Catherine's research focuses on the roles of women in the production and patronage of early modern art in Northern Europe, and she concentrates in the Netherlands and Germany. Her dissertation concerns the reliance on social networks in the patronage of Agnes Bloch, a Dutch 17th century artist who designed and cultivated one of the most famous gardens of the Dutch Golden Age. Uh, Catherine's advisor is Jeffrey Chips Smith. Catherine, the floor is yours, but I'm first going to open your uh, PowerPoint. And that one is here. For the audience, we'll have to make a new PowerPoint, uh, a second part of the PowerPoint uh, in the middle of the talk. That's due to the fact that the, the resolution is very high. Uh, so. Uh, so don't uh, panic if all of a sudden we change uh, the PowerPoint. Flower is yours, Catherine. It's still, you have to put your, your uh, mic on. No, I'll try to do it for you then. Let me see. Where are you? 
There you go. Thank you very much, Stein. Um, also to Lucas for organizing this talk and to everybody who is watching. Um, as Stein mentioned, I think I got a little bit um, excited. So many beautiful images from the Dutch 17th century. So I have a large PowerPoint, but hopefully uh, the viewers will be able to appreciate it. Also, as Stein has mentioned, this research today is a very small portion of my dissertation project, uh, which concerns the social networks of patrons botanist and collector Agnes Bloch. Um, my research project is very much an art history research project, but it is um, interdisciplinary. So today what you will see is a portion of uh, my work which focuses on the history of uh, landscape architecture and gardens, as well as the history of natural sciences, and of course uh, women's studies, which is an overarching concern for me in my work. Now, let's see if this works. Most of us can easily imagine that during the 17th century, women lived a rather difficult life. And it was one where a woman's duties and obligations uh, far outweighed any kind of power they may have. And the reality, however, is a little bit more nuanced than that. And it is true that opportunities were rare uh, for women, particularly when you consider them against opportunities that were available to men. Um, they did contribute to culture, arts, and society more broadly, certainly beyond the framework of the household economy. And even though, um, and one intersection point is, of course, gardens. And the story, the history of the foundation and of the evolution of the botanical garden here in Leiden has been very well studied. But interestingly, one aspect that remains under-researched and understudied is the relationship between the garden and women. And I mean, um, not so much the relationship between women appreciating gardens and visiting gardens, because we know that, but it's about the examination of the opportunities that gardens provided women as a, a avenue through which they could participate not only in the consumption of knowledge and in the social performance of the garden, but importantly in the creation and dissemination of botanical knowledge. And it turns out that the Botanical Garden in Leiden, which was the first one in the Republic, and it was established within the confines of the university, it was a rare public space in which female agency was facilitated. In this context, it's important to understand that I mean female agency as a space where women could participate in the creation and dissemination of knowledge, as I have mentioned, as well as in the formation of their own identities. And that the public space of the botanical garden made that feasible for them, notwithstanding their gender. And I will show that by focusing particularly on the relationship between Agnes Bloch, who was born in 1629 and died in 1704, and the Hortus director, um, Paul Herman, who happened to be there during her peak um, activities in botany, so between 1679 and 1695. And here they are, Agnes Bloch, as portrayed by Adrian van der Werf. And um, I do not have an illustration of Paul Herman, but this here is the very important catalog to which we will return. Before we jump into this, I think it's important to remind ourselves of the gender expectations of the 17th century. Now, those of you who have been fortunate enough to wander around the university buildings in Leiden may well recognize this door. Uh, this is one of Leiden's prettiest courtyards, and this is uh, the courtyard on the Dolensteg, Dolensteg um, directly across from the Parkhouse these days. And what you see at the sign, it is in Latin, but a rough translation of this is Lady Eva von Hochevein, daughter of Albertus, Lord of Hochevein, a very chaste and praiseworthy virgin, established these buildings in 1650 in honor of God to house chaste virgins and honorable widows. Praise the deceased and follow her. <laughs> 
So this is a fairly succinct summary of gender expectations as the mid 17th century. This is um, a place, a housing place devoted to, you know, a daughter, chaste virgins, and honorable widows. As a matter of fact, um, all this was here early. Expectations wholly in line with those set out by Jakob Katz in 1625 in his famous uh, poem on marriage. And here, what you see with this wonderful illustration is the stages of life uh, for a woman illustrated in the shape of a pyramid. And it goes from being a virgin to being a spinster, a bride, being married, a wife, becoming a mother, and then widowhood. So quite literally, in this pyramid of life, it does not get any better than finding a man and having his children. Now, you will not be surprised about this. Um, these expectations were very much written by men. And in fact, um, even the beautiful courtyard and the houses established for widows and those chaste virgins, um, the, the regent was a man. The first female regent was in the 20th century. So um, this tells you an awful lot about men's expectations. And indeed, I thought I'd show this because men also thought that early modern women were tyrants who made them wash the floor and could be witches. So this is a topic for another day, but this gives you a fairly good environment of the environment within which Agnes Bloch was existing. In more seriousness, we know that women made extensive contributions to life. They did so much more than being a mother or a wife. They worked in the market, as we can see here with this beautiful uh, Metsu painting. And from this little vignette, we know they contributed also um, to charity. Women worked at the market as egg sellers and fishwives. Um, they instructed their children. Uh, they taught them how to read. Um, so they uh, performed so much work. And this is a topic about the contribution of women to the economic household of the 17th century, to which uh, Leiden's very own Professor Ariadne Schmidt has devoted um, quite a bit of research. And as uh, to paraphrase Dr. Schmidt, what happens is that women were indispensable to the Dutch economy, but the majority of this labor was unpaid. So they were workshop wives, they worked at the market, they raised the children. But all was not so grim. Uh, we are fortunate also to have several examples of the wonderful cultural and artistic contributions that women made, um, whether, as we see here, uh, we are looking at paintings by uh, Rachel Raus or uh, the paper cuttings of Johanna Kurten or the painting by Leister or glass engravings by the Rumer Fischer sisters who also wrote poems and books of emblems. And of course, Anna Maria von Schurman, who's famous for having um, attended the University of Utrecht, albeit behind a curtain. So nobody could tell that she was really smart. Now, these contributions are wonderful, but it is undeniable that it was difficult for women to participate in the public sphere. And by public sphere here, I mean um, a realm that was not connected to the household economy. And we see here in this portrait, uh, it's a uh, banquet uh, scene from guild members, and they are celebrating the Treaty of Munster. Now you can imagine that amongst these men are diplomats and merchants, and they are city leaders, civic um, ambassadors. What you can't see are women, except for two. The one here, she is serving the food, and then you have a bare-breasted allegory on the flag. So this is the realm within which women were confined. And to the extent that the men at this banquet uh, took the opportunity to discuss, uh, for example, business opportunities and business deals, future uh, venture, uh, diplomatic efforts, whether with the Germanys or France, all of these um, events and negotiations and relationship and the consequent network of knowledge. Women were excluded of that to the extent that it happened within institutions. 
Now, I think it's time to switch to the second PowerPoint. Thank you. So here we have really a um, oversimplification of this dichotomy between the private sphere on the one hand, and you see here um, the house woman cleaning the alley. And of course, people are familiar with this wonderful painting by Vermeer. There's another woman here and she's embroidering and watching the children that play on the stoop. That's one side of um, life. And in the 17th century, um, a very good representation of what the public sphere is, is represented here by this town hall. But town hall could have been replaced by the buildings of the Admiralty for the VOC, could have been replaced, um, of course, by the stock exchange. And what you see when you look at the scenes inside of those buildings is that they are populated entirely by men. Um, this um, theoretical framework of public and private here, um, I've chosen to use a gray fuzzy line between the two because it is not as stark as that. And um, if there are any scholars of Habermas online, they will also point out that nowadays it's, it's really more accepted to speak of various publics. Um, and that is all true. Here, I use this dichotomy between private and public as a shortcut. And it is um, appropriate to speak about it in this way, particularly when we're talking about the natural, the field of natural sciences near the end of the 17th century, particularly when it comes to botany. Brian Ogilvy uh, places the birth of natural sciences as a discipline in its own right during the 16th century. And during the 17th century, this discipline simply explodes. At the center of it all is the Dutch Republic. And as Maggie so wonderfully pointed out, this is a time of discovery, of exploration. The VOC, um, the Dutch East India Company, the Dutch West India Company are bringing to shore more plant and specimens and exotica than anybody could have ever thought possible. And this is illustrated very well here with the frontispiece uh, by, of Paul Herman's uh, Horti Academici, which shows here, this is the representation of the universities, at the university as Palas Atene, and she is receiving gifts from the four continents in the form of uh, plant and specimens. There was, however, one downside to the increase in popularity of natural history, and that downside is linked to specialization. Um, and that specialization meant that there was an increase in institutional, institu institutionalization, which we've discussed uh, women were excluded from. And it also meant that women were pushed to the margins uh, when it came, not so much the consumption of natural knowledge, but particularly to the creation and the dissemination of that knowledge. And that's a point that um, scholar Londa, Londa Schiebinger has really explored um, extensively, including with her book, uh, which I love, uh, The Mind Has No Sex, question mark, because it is a question mark as so, insofar as the 17th century is concerned. So while women could provide financial support, um, they could attend lectures, they could see things, they could learn things, they were limited because early modern botany was very much a collective enterprise. And if you were not able to participate in the key components of creation and dissemination, you were simply not part of that public sphere. And it's against this background that we come to the Leiden Botanical Garden. Now, um, the general timeline of the garden is that it was um, thought about almost immediately upon the creation of the university in 1575. Uh, but it takes some time to get everybody organized. And so the resolution that finally creates the garden uh, is passed in 1590. And the garden is not planted until 1594. So in 1601, um, this is a general layout of the garden. And by then, there has been the creation here of this gallery, which is called an ambulacrum. 
And this is very relevant because it turns out that this establishes the public purpose of this university building. So this is a university um, laboratory, for lack of a better word, even though there's a um, question of anachronism here. But this means that this is open to the public. These rules here, uh, which I will not read, but basically are fairly basic. Do not walk over the flower beds. Do not pick the flowers to take them home. Do not damage them. So rules that everybody could follow, even though they were written in Latin. And these rules would have appeared here on the front is, uh, on the front here on the facade of this uh, gallery. What's important is that these rules meant that the garden was meant to be a public space, and we see that when you zoom in and you see instructions taking place. And the rules, you'll notice, do not say anything about women or they don't say anything about visitors other than um, scholars. And that's because it is anticipated that they will be there. And they do show up. This here is an image of inside that gallery where you see very clearly a child, a dog, and a woman. They are enjoying, they are performing the garden as this um, social activity. Now, I doubt that the creators of the garden ever even thought about whether or not women should be admitted to the garden because it's an imagery with which everybody would have been familiar, starting with Eve in the Garden of Eden or the resurrected Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene. And from medieval times onwards, um, oh, sorry, I forgot. Of course, the Maid of Holland is, sits within a garden. And from medieval times onward, um, people would have thought about women and their roles as providers of herbal remedies. So here we see uh, the apothecary of a noble woman and a woman working in an apothecary shop. So the notion itself is not that controversial. What is special, however, is that women use the space to transcend the traditional roles that have been assigned to them. The um, so Agnes Bloch was not the first woman to participate and contribute to the garden. And uh, Florica Egmond, who's also associated with Leiden University, has written um, a wonderful book about the world of Carolus Clusius, in which she does explore the role of the women that surrounded him. There was a difference, however, in that these women were noble women and they had known Clusius personally. So they, there is that exchange, but the extent to which they use the botanical garden to really become um, disseminators of uh, knowledge is different. When we have Agnes Block here, she is in the center, things turn around. And I think, of course, I'm impartial, but I think that she is the most remarkable woman to have ever had a relationship with the Leiden Hortus, at least um, as far as the mid 18th century. So in this portrait, it tells us pretty much everything we want to know about Agnes Block. She is um, a matron. These here are likely to step grandchildren. She did not have children of her own. She is very much in control in the center of this composition, which her husband is pushed over to the right. And she is in front of her prized country estate of Pfeifferhof, uh, which she acquired in 1670. And it was from there that she raised um, exotic and rare species, which she then had illustrated by the very best artists of the time, including women such as Alida Vitos and uh, Maria Sibylla Merian and her daughters. So she assembled this fabulous collection of art, but that collection is really a reflection of how much botanical knowledge she accumulated. Um, as we've discussed, Bloch could not become a member, uh, she couldn't study medicine at the University of Leiden. She could not become a member of the Royal Society in London or in Paris. And by the end of the 17th century, the Royal Society in London was really the arbiter of knowledge. And it was the seal of legitimacy that anybody uh, who wanted to present him or herself as an expert needed these opportunities were foreclosed. And that is why her relationship with Paul Herman is so critical. Uh, Paul Herman 
wrote two books about the Leiden Hortus. The first one in 1687, we have an excerpt of it here, and he mentions Agnes Block three times in respects to uh, plants and the includes one plate, um, so one illustration. The language is very interesting uh, because we know that Agnes Block gives at least two specimens to the Leiden, so she to the botanical garden. So she is contributing to the garden that is seen as the foremost creator of botanical knowledge in the Dutch Republic. She has contributed to that. She is highly versed in botany. And also, I recently came upon this species uh, in her garden. So Paul Herman thinks of it as an important thing to go and visit Agnes. So there is truly that exchange that takes place all within um, the relationship with between Paul Herman and the Leiden uh, garden. Now, three years later, and unfortunately after he died, um, sorry, in in 1698, which was three years after uh, Paul Herman died, another book appeared, this time Paradisus Batavus. And this book was published, um, it was completed and co-authored by William Sherman, who was in England. And the language in this book is really interesting because it speaks of Agnes Bloch, sure, as uh, the most excellent wife of the most praised master, um, Simon de Flins, who is her second husband, but mostly as a first cultivator of the most exotic breeds, a studious investigator, and then she is generous and she sp spreads her species into the gardens of others. So particularly the, the descriptors as cultivator and investigator are remarkable because here, whereas respectable, honest are the types of trope uh, that we hear often about women in books, uh, this is about being polite. Uh, here, this is a characterization as someone who is participating in the public sphere of botanical knowledge. This, um, arguably, by using this language, Herman here brings Agnes Bloch into the sphere of world of equal with men. And this language, this endorsement by Paul Herman is even more impactful when we consider that a book review appeared in 1699, so a few years later, in the Philosophical Transactions, which was the journal of record for the Royal Society in London. And this book review is being authored by John Ray, who by then is the most celebrated uh, botanist in England. And he writes that Herman is, uh, the name alone is sufficient to recommend it to the ingenious reader. And he also speaks about descriptions that are so accurate and alone to lead us into a certain and unerring knowledge. Now, Brian O'Gilvy also has described the 17th century as subscribing to a cult of fact uh, because of this obsession with empirical knowledge and discovery. So to have such an endorsement for Paul Herman speaks volume. And for Bloch, this means that not only is she um, associated with Herman in print, uh, which really raises her profile, because anytime somebody picks up, of course, Paradisus Batavus cannot help but find Agnes Bloch, um, to whom her entry appears several times, entries about her, and the um, excerpt about her aster covers five pages. So this is a significant entry, uh, which elevates Bloch's legitimacy. But in doing so, um, she is now indirectly receiving the seal of approval um, of the Royal Society. So to wrap this up, thanks to her relationship with Paul Herman and the Leiden Hortus Botanicus, Agnes Bloch can go beyond the traditional roles that have been ascribed to her as mother and stepmother and widow, and she can also so go beyond um, what's expected of women in garden, which is that they're used as sociable space and spaces where they can learn to communicate with God, the book of nature, and that's, uh, that type of imagery. Here, she transcends these roles and she is established as a knowledgeable botanist, a generous contributor to the garden of other experts and other amateurs, and in particular, um, the Leiden Hortus Botanicus. So in establishing this relationship,
she is capable of securing for herself a place in a public sphere of botany and to cement her um, her reputation in print, which is a medium which will, of course, uh, is immortal. Um, so it will transcend boundaries and languages. Um, and that's really quite wonderful for a woman who was not um, even versed in Latin. And this allows her to still to this day be known as we see on this uh, medal as Flora Batava. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. It was uh, so interesting to, to see how, how very large, very specific roles in a certain society are given to women and how the garden in the Dutch <laughs> and how the garden in that 17th century uh, gives some place for, for to, to get more out of it, to escape that very narrow image. And what fascinates me a lot were the two pictures you show, Eve on the, other, on the one hand, and then that uh, women as providers of herbal remedies uh, on the other hand. In how far were those models then models of escape? Because Eve is not directly the model you wanted to have in the 17th century, of course. Huh? The provider of herbal remedies, is that a model that Agnes Block played with? Not that, um, not that we know of. Uh, she was interested, and that's, uh, that's an interesting um, difference, and that's something that Brian Ogilvy describes in his book, which is called The Science of Describing, which is there's always an interest in knowing the properties of the plants, but when you go through these catalogs that Paul Herman is writing, for example, it's really about describing the plant. What does it look like? How does it grow? How can you get it here? Um, and this is what Agnes Block seems to be focused on. Um, there's no, so we have record, there's one book of her uh, wonderful watercolor con collection that survives intact in the Rijksmuseum, and it has notes about which artists she commissioned, and it's, so it has beautiful pictures, but there's no indication that there's um, a medicinal section to her garden. Uh, so we know she had orchards, she probably had a kitchen garden, but there's no sense that medicine was where she was going with this. Mm -hmm. Great. Maggie also has a question I see in the chat, so I give the floor to Maggie. Okay. We're in the same room, so competing mics. Um, so when you reference Agnes Block as the first cultivator of exotic breeds, does that mean she was breeding different species together to create a new species, or that she was really well connected with the VOC or WIC somehow in getting things that were thus unheard of in, in um, uh, the Netherlands? What she was doing is, um, I believe that the first cultivator for many breeds, uh, which may appear to be here. Oh, Maggie, can you put out the mic? Because that would be easier to understand, uh, Catherine. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, so as first cultivator, there are um, species that appear in her garden for the first time in the Netherlands. And famously, she is known as being uh, the first uh, first person, not even first woman, first person in Europe to grow a pineapple in the Netherlands. Um, so this is something she manages to do. I'm not aware of her practicing um, crossbreeding or anything like that, uh, but more so of bringing seeds. And she evidently had a talent for managing to grow these exotic uh, plants, which who would have thought of growing a uh, pineapple in the Netherlands? And anybody who can see behind us um, can see what the weather is like. <laughs> rain, more rain, you know, frost. Um, so this is not pineapple country. She did it. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, my mic was off. I also had a question regarding uh, the, uh, the, the, the the adjective most respectable in how far is that uh, also gendered or do you also find it to describe uh, people, uh, men who are dealing with gardens? 
You know, that's an excellent question. Um, I have done um, a thorough search. So this example of using the two catalogs by Paul Herman is really quite um, narrow. I did look at all of the botanical treatises that were popular in the 17th century in the Netherlands. And it turns out that, yes, it is very much a gendered trope, calling somebody most respectable. Uh, at some point, they'd call about, they talk to her um, about her being a praiseworthy wife. And there's even, um, some uh, language, um, I think Jakob Brin, uh, the Polish merchant and botanical expert who publishes widely, he uses also very gendered language to describe her, which does not appear. When it comes to men, they refer to each other as the learned, you know, Bohava or whoever. So men are learned, they are um, serious author, uh, but they are not respected or um, honest. You know, nobody feels the need to say that Hans yeah. Lund is honest. <laughs> yeah. There's a question from Claudia, Claudia Swan. Uh, I wonder, uh, do you have any sense of what was cultivated and by whom in the gardens in Amsterdam that were laid down at the time of the expansion of the Grachtengordel? Um, yes, thank you, we do. Uh, we do have a sense of what was there uh, because um, Kommelin, uh, that there were two Kumlins. Uh Johannes was the first uh, director of the garden, and then in 1693, his nephew Casper took over, and they did produce a catalog. And they had quite a few exotic species also, but they were very much playing catch up because um, Amsterdam, the garden was initially created. First of all, it was created much later, several decades after uh, the one in Leiden, and it was primarily a medical hortus. And so it's not until later um, that I think uh, under uh, probably the last 25 years or so of the 17th century that more exotic species and that it turns into more of a botanical garden. But we do have records of what is happening. And of course, the first extension is 1612 and I lose track. I think the last one is around um, the 1650s or 60s, um, but it, we do have track, yes. Uh, and Claudia Swan ex explicitly wanted to know uh, what about the private gardens between the homes and the canals? We know that Agnes herself. The canal, sorry. She, um, Agnes Block herself, had a garden on the Herrenhach, um, and she was uh, part of the first extension. She didn't move there until a little bit later, but her, she had a big double house, and there was a small garden behind. All we know is that it was a kitchen garden, um, and I know that uh, the Van Loon, for example, families. Um, all of the houses along the Herrenhach um, and the Deutz family also had gardens. They tended to be more ornamental and small kitchen garden parts. So um, as far as I know, uh, and of course more um, research can be done into that, but as far as I know, these uh, were on far, far smaller scales, uh, specifically when compared to the gardens that were being planted along the Vecht uh, or um, along the river Spavne in Harlem. All right, thank you. Last question, pa Paramita Paul, and we have to stop. I was wondering about the portraits of almhouses, Regentis, uh, uh from the 17th century. Do you think these women can also be regarded as agents in society at a time? That's a very good question. I do think that this was a way in which women had um, a limited kind of power. So women could be regents. If you go through a book um, of the description of the city, uh, I Leiden, there's one dated 1614, for example, and it provides lists of all the important institutions. Women show up as house as uh, regents for uh, usually poor houses, lepers house, sick houses, orphanages. And even then, so women are regent, there's often a male overseer um, still above that, but women are in charge of budget, of making sure that the rules are followed and so on. So I do agree, um, that is another avenue through which women can find some agency, but there's one difference, which is most of these women are, um, if not noble, because we don't really speak of nobility in the Netherlands, but we do speak of an upper class and they're often the wives of um, the burgomaster. Uh, so they're the wives of mayors and other administrators. So they tend not to be people like Agnes Bloch, who as a Mennonite had no access um, to, even her husband could not be a member of at City Hall or so there were serious limits on how she could use those networks.
All right. Thank you. It's special in that respect. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much, Maggie. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for, for being here, for asking questions. Uh, to next week, we have two uh, museum talks, one by Marissa Bass. That's the 2nd of November. That starts at 18 hours Central European time. And uh, we also have one on Thursday. That's because there's a beautiful exhibition at the moment at the Lakenhall in Leiden, the work of Claudi Jungstra, who gets inspired, for example, by the black, uh, a contemporary artist who gets inspired by uh, black as used in the portraits of the Burgundians. So that's uh, on Thursday, the 5th of November at uh, 15 hours Central European time. And Marissa Bas, I forgot to say, will talk about Rembrandt. Claudia Jungstra will be accompanied by a lecture by Anne-Sophie Lehmann, who will, call about, who will talk about the materiality of Claudia Jungstra's work. Thank you again, Maggie and Catherine, and thank you all uh, for being here. See you next week. Bye-bye.